Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Hope you all had a very enjoyable lunch and a look out at the Charles River in the sunshine. We put that on specially for you. And now we have a special announcement, which I'm not going to make, but I'm going to leave it up to Richard Minerich to make himself. And his talk is entitled F Sharp in the Classroom and the Lab. Over to you. <laughs> Well, hello, everybody. Um, Ted is here with me and Talbot. And we just released Professional F Sharp 2.0. I thought I'd mention it at the very beginning, which is pretty exciting. It's a book for um, those familiar with object-oriented programming that want to learn functional in uh, the .NET space. So uh, it goes over all of uh, F Sharp uh, object-oriented stories and how to program functionally, philosophy-wise, and in practice. And it ends up with a lot of use cases and uh, specific examples. So it's a great book, and you guys should check it out. Um, I, myself, I've been um, talking about F Sharp uh, and teaching it for about two years now, maybe a little over that. And uh, today I'm going to talk about a, my two most recent um, sort of adventures in F Sharp and how they went and um, how it applies to the, the classroom and the lab. So I know that we've been drilling this all day, and I think everybody put in their slides after the announcement. But I think it's really important, because this really like today marks the death of F Sharp as a Microsoft specific technology, really. And that means that everyone can feel comfortable using it because no matter what happens, you have F Sharp. It's yours, it's the community's. It's a, it's a great thing. Um, so there, there's something I'd like to talk about first, and that's that there's a little bit of a crisis. This is actually from a, a professor that takes pictures of students sleeping in his class and posts them on his website, which I think is great. But it, <laughs> the crisis is one of, <laughs> it, I think it's really funny, yeah. Uh, what can you do, right? Um, there's declining enrollment, right? And at the same time, the attrition rates are really high in CompSci. And it's a, it's a big problem. Um, and also, those coming out of CompSci, as far as I've seen in the, the jobs I've worked at, they routinely fail, not difficult um, and like uh, interview questions, things like that. It's, uh, it's getting to be a little bit ridiculous, right, the, the situation. And I think it has a lot to do with the changing of technology um, people, uh, students have come to learn in new ways, and uh, the establishment is sort of um, lagging behind a little bit and not leveraging new techniques. So a student that comes out of school, they're used to this lecture-style classroom, um, and then th they're forced to learn on their own all of a sudden and play with technologies and figure out APIs, but they were never given these skills. So um, I've done a, a bit of research on this, just because I like reading research papers mostly. Uh, and uh, I like teaching. Um, so this is a quote from um, a paper that was about using games to teach, to, to teach comp sci students. And um, I mean, really what they're finding is that these students need to be engaged more. They need, like, they need, to, be, um, they need to be given things that are more similar to what, what they have in, at their, in their internet every day. They go home, they're using Facebook, they're using all these really rich media engaging things. And then in the classroom, it's a blackboard. Or it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I have had professors that use uh, those clear slides still, and they write on them. And it's, uh, people are passing out left and right, pretty much, you know. It's, uh, that's not the only thing to blame, right? There's, uh, there's this whole problem with kids coming out of high school. They have lower math and logic skills than maybe 10 years ago. But I, I do think a lot of this stems from that, that the students are not uh, being engaged in what they're familiar with in their outside of school sort of environment. I mean, uh, some other things, uh, poorly designed labs, and I mean, also uh, the whole promoting of uh, research over teaching is a big problem, too. I mean, I went to UMass Amherst, and they're very high on the list of number of pub published papers. But at the same time, a lot of times it seems like, I mean, once I started doing undergraduate research, it was great. But before that, it's like the teachers didn't care, really. <laughs> so um, I think F-sharp is a great language for this, sort of um, teaching as play. I know that one of the first really engaging things 
uh, in my programming career was when I learned Logo and Lego Logo. And I got to actually see what the results of what I did what, like by typing one thing at a time. And most people don't know, but Logo is actually a dialect of Lisp. So um, it's very exciting. Hi. Oh. I didn't take any of the intro classes there. I transferred in. So, but anyway, um, I, I really like a lot of the professors, and they're really smart people with a lot on their minds. But they, they have, like I said, a lot on their minds. They're doing tons of research. It's pushed really hard, and um, so they they need to be able to recycle materials, and that's just the way it is. And it's good. That, and I think that these engaging, um, non-lecture style classes can be taught with recycled materials in a very effective way. Um, so, anyway, let's try and see what happens. This, this play is a, is a really good way to teach. And I, I recently have had some experience with this. Um, if you can connect the syntax directly with the, the effect, then you can sort of build up a, a model in your mind of how the language works and how all the pieces fit together a little bit at a time, instead of having to try to memorize a lot of things and then recall what it was that was the right thing to do. Um, f -sharp Interactive is similar to Logo in, in that you have this sort of environment and there are some tools that you can use to show things on the screen. but it, it's, uh, of course, um, designed to be much more. So um, you can do things like you can use the whole uh, tool chain once you're in Visual Studio, or you can use uh, the whole mono tool chain in, in Linux. It's, it's quite nice. Another good feature of F Sharp for this is that its, um, its syntax is very flexible. Because of, it, because of all the, uh, the contracts that are given to you and the fact that um, operators can be overloaded, you can make really nice DSLs. And these DSLs can be used um, to sort of to take the uh, syntax as an obstacle away. Because what I'm talking about here not is really teaching F sharp, it's teaching in F sharp. You want, you're trying to convey some idea, and you want to provide like, a very simple set of tools to make that idea happen. You don't want to overload the student with lots and lots of cruft that they'll never use. Um, the malleable syntax, though, is very useful in, in many respects. This is uh, Stefan Forkman's um, natural spec library that is just for unit testing in a very similar to English um, style, which I really like. Hmm. So um, re just recently, I was at the uh, Commercial Users of Functional Programming Conference. And uh, I did a tutorial on F-sharp. It was about four hours long. I gave the students um, a, a prepackaged set that included a library and some template information so that they could play. right? And then most of the rest of the time was just walking around helping people and um, getting the ideas together. Now, not everything was perfect, of course. This is the first time I ever did it. And I ran into a few problems uh, with Mac machines. Um, I had a, you know, a couple of people that, that struggled with the environment after just installing it. But in reality, like, uh, a classroom isn't one four-hour block. You can have office hours. You can have people um, help. And, and actually, overall, it went swimmingly. Like, the, uh, ev the reviews were, were just fantastic. Everyone had a great time. And, uh, there was a lot of competition amongst the people, which was very motivating. In fact, we had a lunch break, and almost everyone skipped it so they could work on the project. Um, the, the key components, though, are the simple API. The simple API and the template that exists beforehand that demonstrates the entire API. So you give them all the tools they need, and then you let them explore those tools. So let me see if I can make this uh, simple demonstration of this work. Uh, I think I might need to go to my desktop real quick. Huh. OK, so um, this is the. Um, this is what it looks like when ants are battling it out. And there's lots of these little screens. Oh, it's not letting me drag them. That's, I wasn't able to test this with multiple Wait, monitors. Can you put away your bag? Sure. Hold on one sec. There. All right, is that, does that work? Can everybody hear me? Good, good. good. So we have these, uh, these scoreboard, 
Then we have all these ant instances. They looked a lot nicer when they were on my side, but I'm just going to drag them over. And so these, uh, these are different sets of AI. Each combination of AI is shown. Each one of these windows is the exact same thing as what the students were given to play in. But then at the end, I just take the same thing because it's all very modular, and I wrap it in, in slightly more code, and that turns into this, uh, this, this gaming system, right? So they're competing against each other, and um, the ants pretty the way the rules work is is you have to collect half the food, or there's 10, 000, after 10,000 turns, whoever has the most food wins. Um, the green spots are the food, the gray spots are the black ant pheromone, and the purple spots are the red ant pheromone. Um, some of these are AIs that I wrote just playing, and some of them are AIs that students wrote in, the, in that test uh, in the, uh, at CUFP. But in general, um, most of them completed it, that, that actually got going, and uh, everyone had a great time. So I'm just going to. Oop. That ended up in a bad spot, huh? All right. So um, given this uh, pseudo decision tree, um, it this pretty much represents what the ant AI that I gave everyone does. It's not really important to read the whole thing because you won't have time. But the whole idea is that there's this sort of elegant structure here. And that can be really easily be expressed in F-sharp using only a couple of the language constructs. You don't need to use everything in the language, just the couple of parts that make for the nice sort of DSL sort of feel and that express what you're trying to, to d demonstrate. Um, in order to um, get into the finalist competition, because I was giving away a copy of Visual Studio, um, they had to beat this AI which was the AI they're given. So they just have to beat the one they're given pretty much by tweaking it somehow and changing it. It wasn't a very high standard, but it was enough to make everyone very motivated. Plus, they knew they were fighting against each other for books and stuff in, in Visual Studio. So in, once you get to F sharp, it actually turns into a, a tree-like syntax that's, that exactly mirrors um, what's on the other side. And this is mostly just through active patterns and in, in matching, right? Um, you can kind of hide all that away give them something really nice to play with. Um, <laughs> but um, the logic is really easy to understand. In fact, people had never touched F sharp or Camel there before, and they were up and running in no time. Um, the, the other uh, great effect of this is you have immediate feedback without crashes, because I gave them the tools to use in F sharp Interactive. So they're running this in F sharp Interactive. They can swap out the AI and see what their changes do. Um, so while this might be easy for a beginner to grasp, I also provide all the code for all of these active patterns and stuff. So people that were expert already or already had some experience, they could kind of dig in deeper and start looking at the other constructs. And I feel like that's an important thing in the classroom, too. Because one of the biggest problems is that you have a very wide variety of skill levels in any classroom. Some students are going to go home, they're going to be passionate, and they're going to research the crap out of things. Other students, they're, <laughs> they're there. They care. They do care. But they, don't, they have other things in their life. They're not quite as passionate. So I think it's important to cater to both students. The passionate ones, you have to give the additional resources to do the work. You can't. It's not right to hold them back. At the same time, it's not right to just cut people off if they're trying hard, but yet they just aren't super passionate. So I've been thinking that a really good way to go about this, I have not implemented this yet, but I think it's going to be the next iteration of this contest, um, is based on continuous integration. So the whole idea in continuous integration is you have a server. It's a, it's, it's a source control server. And when people check in, that server, the, the check-in code, check code is compiled and then used somehow. Usually a test suite is run against it. This is a very common thing in the industry. And it actually makes your life as a developer much, much easier. But I've never seen anything like it in academia. So um, the whole idea here is you know, the teacher gives you the hidden implementation in a template. Then you play in that, and then you have your spot in source control you check into. And then various things can happen at that point. You can have a test suite, and the, the student can get a grade based on that set of how many of those tests pass. Um, you could also have a contest where all these, these uh, co this code is injected into the contest somehow. Um, one thing at UMass, actually, that I thought was really great in our uh, operating systems classes, we had something quite similar to this, but you would email your code in, and then it would automatically run, and it would just tell you how many of the tests pass, pretty much which ones. It has a list. you like, this one passed, this one didn't. It doesn't say what they do, but it was really like, uh, I never worked so hard in a class, pretty much. Uh, you know, I already had an A, but I still just wanted to get that last, like, that last one. That, what was that test failing from? And it's a, you can, it can drive you insane. 
but it's great that way, right? Um, but the whole idea is to give the students time to play and, and room to wiggle, you know, not like this is the right answer and be very rigid about it, but um, have a way for them to try to explore the space. And the, the additional benefit of the CI type in integration is that um, you can teach the students about things that are real in the industry. And this is a big problem because the students come to the industry, they're not in academia in these classes, they're not using the same tools. Or maybe they're using tools from a few years ago, but it's not quite the same, right? But if a student's already familiar with continuous integration, maybe they're familiar with source control tools, they're familiar with unit testing, well, that's going to be huge when they go to interview. That's just like, uh, if it would be a dream to have a candidate that actually knew what unit testing was right out of college. <laughs> I mean, it knew how to do it right, not necessarily knew what the word meant. I, I've interviewed quite a few people at, at, uh, at along, I mean, of several, and it just it's, it gets kind of depressing after a while. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so, uh, what I think is automated systems they they take the work away from the teacher, right? They make, and students like these automated systems because they're similar, they're fast, and they're engaging, just like the video games they're playing in their dorms at night. So they have this fast response time. They show you what they're, you're doing, and they, they knock you down really fast so you can keep trying. It's a, sort of a dopamine reaction sort of thing, right? And then at the same time, you're, so you're giving this engaging classwork. You're doing less work because you're not maintaining the assignments. You've got a system to put them in. And then in the end, everyone wins because you have these students at the end that can actually participate in the industry right out of school. So the other experience that I've had recently was doing some consulting for the company that I'm now working for. But this was actually, I just went as a consultant originally, and um, it sort of blossomed from there. Um, F Sharp has some really great properties for scientific computing. It's remarkably similar to, similar to MATLAB and syntax. It, it, it just looks really nice. And like people that are used to MATLAB can switch to F Sharp very quickly. Um, except uh, F Sharp deploys nicely as opposed to being a beast. And uh, it has types that protect you from, from doing bad things and units of measure. These, uh, these are very important, right? It also is much faster and takes less memory. So there's a lot of great things about F-sharp in this sort of environment. Oh, oh yeah, the tools, too. You have things like infer.net and solver foundation. That can really be great. So this is a rather simple story. Of, uh, it's a, it's, so this is a, there's this thing called the PEP list. It's the politically exposed person list. Uh, it's not quite a list. It's uh, something that's defined by the UN as someone who uh, is politically visible, right? And they, they decided in 2003 that if you're a politically exposed person, banks must try much harder when they must investigate you much more than the average person. This is a big deal because it put a lot of work in the banks. And so these companies started selling these lists of politically exposed persons. Banks are, like, the banks have to buy these lists. But these lists are like 4 million people long. So it's, like, it's impossible. It's an impossible list to deal with. So um, what Mark did, Mark Schiffer, who I'm now working with, uh, he, about five years ago, he did, decided to use the, uh, something similar to the Google PageRank algorithm. It's just a standard eigenvector ranking method. Um, you just make a matrix with the, the data in it, and then you, know, you, you use an iterative uh, reduction to get it to, uh, <laughs> to where you need. And then at the end, you have a, a very nice ranking. Now, there's, there's more modern techniques now, and we're, we're looking into that. It's actually why I went on to try to look at things like factor graphs. But um, as, for, as for now, like, the industry, uh, this is state of the art, far beyond what anyone else is doing. They're using like, very, very bad things that you would be shocked and appalled if you knew about. <laughs> it's just how it is, right? So the end result is that banks can prioritize who they're looking at, because they have buildings full of people whose job it is to investigate their customers pretty much so they don't get sued by, by the government or ha get called in front of Congress and get yelled at or get like a $500 million fine, which has happened. Uh, it's a pretty big deal for them. So I know this isn't necessarily the best MATLAB, but these are actually what we started with and what we ended with. So I thought they were better that way. I actually, I posted this on Twitter and someone that was really familiar with MATLAB was like, that's terrible MATLAB. Here's a much better example. But at the same time, this is really from the industry and it's, it's what I really came across. Um, here, R is the rank. E is the external attribute vector, which just gives weights. Um, D is uh, just a convergence measure, measure, so you know when you're done. And A is a relationship matrix that has all of this, the data in it. Um, so this is an improvement, right? 
And I, uh, this slide is actually kind of a shout out to Don Syme because I love his pleasure and pain uh, C sharp slides. But uh, the issue is more of one of deployment integration. Because like, well, maybe you can write better MATLAB and maybe uh, this MATLAB isn't even that bad. MATLAB is really, really hard to integrate with. So what Mark was doing previously is he had a machine running MATLAB and he would push and pull from SQL and then his, S, his uh, C Sharp team was uh, writing against that SQL. Later on, he had them convert his, uh, his MATLAB into C Sharp, but then he couldn't read it because he's a researcher. He doesn't know C Sharp or object-oriented programming. And then it ended up being a bunch of errors because the, the, the programmers didn't really understand what the MATLAB was doing. They didn't fundamentally understand what the algorithm was for and how it worked. So there was a big mismatch there. And I've seen that in many places in the industry now. And I, I'm sure it's happening in academia in some places too. Like you have uh, your undergraduate researchers or your graduate researchers maybe write something in Java while you use a different language or MATLAB to interface with that. And maybe they implement something correctly because they don't fully understand what the algorithm is supposed to do. So this is a bit one-sided, but this is my experience with MATLAB. <laughs> really, F Sharp has a lot going for it. Um, it's very fast. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's specific in terms of its types so that you can be sure that you're correct. It has general purpose tools, which are great for data mining. Well, MATLAB does beat it in some ways still because there are a lot of great tools in MATLAB for different types of engineering and such. So that's definitely something that uh, I don't think is going to change because those tools uh, cost a lot to develop. But if you're not using those tools and you're just doing some simple uh, number manipulation, then I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, there's a very easy deployment story. Everything just integrates nicely. In, in, in F Sharp, uh, to C Sharp, and and uh, elsewhere, but like, but the the <laughs> so your options with with uh, MATLAB are like COM. You can use COM. You can use this nice uh, interface that wraps. It runs like a little mini G JVM inside of your uh, inside of your uh, .NET. It, it, they're all slow and, and bad, and and like the data transfer back and forth is not good. So um, the, the F Sharp story here is really great, and especially the the tool chain because you have a lot of things like uh, fast matrix multiplication libraries out there and lots of vendors making very good tools for .NET. Um, finally, the, the biggest thing that I think is the integration between researchers and development. Because on one hand, you have researchers who don't really understand this object-oriented code, and then you have the developers who don't really understand the algorithms. And then you put them in different rooms and they don't talk to each other except when they're angry. <laughs> it's, it's a bad situation, right? So in this case, I think that F Sharp can really bring these people together. Because if you're already a C Sharp developer, F Sharp is within your grasp. You can learn it. It's not that hard. It really isn't. And then if, you're if your researchers are writing in F Sharp, and your, your programmers are also writing in F Sharp, or maybe some C Sharp too, everyone understands what's going on. They can actually talk about how things work. And I, I think that it really will move that wall between research and development. So finally, I think in terms of education, there's a really nice path from beginning to end in terms of F-sharp. If you learn about computer science in F-sharp, at the same time you'll learn about F-sharp and you'll learn about the .NET framework. Now, from there you can go right into industry because you've got tools that are useful in industry. You've got skills. Um, but you can go into research too and then you have an environment that's remarkably similar to, similar to MATLAB, which is quite nice. It's quite nice to work in. I, I really like F-sharp for this and uh, especially data mining. You can do all kinds of web scraping and um, pull from large databases. And even in, in the new SQL server, you can actually put F Sharp inside of the SQL server. You can write .NET code. So you, you can uh, write against very large databases and have it run in place, which is quite nice. Um, and finally, when, once the graduates leave, they'll be, able to work with in, in, they'll be able to work in labs and have real industry experience, but be able to integrate well into other teams as well. So you won't have that situation where a grad student sits and waits for years as, in order to find like a, a job they can fit in. Um, it really is all about the industry experience in the end, I think. And I think it's a, it's a very important thing to focus on in F Sharp because it's very closely related to C Sharp. The tools are all the same. And if you learn to work in F Sharp, then you can certainly, you can certainly do C Sharp, although it'll be painful. I mean, my experience is quite painful. Once you've gone there, you don't go back, right? So finally, I'd like to, to mention um, here in this building every Monday, 
Um, around 6.30, the F-Sharp user group, the New England F-Sharp user group meets. Um, so if you're in the area, I recommend coming. It's a, quite a nice group. Um, I used to be one of the leaders, but now I just recently moved to uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm also starting uh, my own user group that meets on the same day at the same time, except in, uh, in New York City and the Avenue of the Americas in the Microsoft building. So if you're in that area, then you should come to my group. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, intended to, to speak on uh, Professional F-Sharp a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's really a great book, and I, I hope you all check it out, because we put a lot of love into it. It's, uh, it was quite a lot of love. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me um, or you know, contact me in person or on Twitter. I'm Rickasaurus. So, uh, it was great talking to you guys. Thanks. And a request that speakers should use the mic. So, questions? You got some. So, you don't want, like, yeah. Bayard Rock is actually the, where the Battle of the Bulge ended and we defeated the Nazis, which is great. But the company is a brand new company that's focused on bringing um, cutting edge machine learning technology to solving certain types of problems inside banks, mostly around ranking risks. Not, ri not risks in actually the products the banks have, but more along the risks of customers and potential, um, not like, are you risky for a credit card, but it's like, you know, um, are you a drug kingpin? Are you a terrorist? Things like this. These are important things because um, one thing that Mark did recently that actually has caused him quite a lot of drama and partially started, caused this new company to start was that at the former company he worked for, he, he used this page rank algorithm and he found a bunch of terrorists on the, uh, the TSA, uh, not the TSA, the, you know, I guess it's TSA, the, the, the pilot's license list in the United States. So a bunch of these 9-11 uh, involved terrorists still had their pilot's licenses in the United States. And uh, he found it and then, of course, they kind of stonewalled him at that point. But, um, you know, he was, and then, a bunch of things happened, and he decided, well, he doesn't want to risk this other company that's owned by his father that he used to work at. He wants to start this new one. And so I decided to come on because it sounds really exciting and fun. You know. And he likes F sharp, so it's a total win. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, with that, thank you again, Rick. And uh, maybe we could just ask are the other authors of the book here? Are they gone? Ted? Oh, Tom is right there. Right. Is Ted here? Okay, so now you know who's, who's one of the other authors. Great. Ted, Ted slipped out, but he might be back. Okay, so our next speaker is Peter. Peter Sistoff from... So he's come quite a long way, and he's been involved in F Sharp for quite a long time in education, and he's going to give us a, a lowdown on what he's been doing.
So can you hear me? Okay. So um, I'm, uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about a course I've, uh, I've developed uh, teaching programming language concepts uh, using F sharp. Um, <coughs> so the course is uh, called program uh, Programming Language Concepts, uh, or the and it's for undergraduates in software development, not computer science, so it's sort of a software engineering course. And I'll talk about the course goals, the concepts I teach, some examples from the course, and the experience using F sharp for this purpose. But first, a few words about myself. Uh, so I have a background in programming languages, especially partial evaluation many years ago, and now more interested in end user software development and uh, technology for that. Uh, I've done some open source stuff uh, uh, back in time, uh, notably Moscow ML implementation together with people in Moscow and uh, Cambridge, and a collection library for .NET and some books. Uh, it's hard to read, but this is uh, Java precisely and C sharp precisely. So also some object oriented synths and an annotated version of uh, C sharp standard version two. <coughs> so <coughs> the overall course design here is that the students are on their fifth semester in this software development education. They already know Java and they know C sharp well. They have done big projects in both of them, and they have learned a little F sharp at this point when they take the course. And the goal of the course is to uh, actually give the students a stronger understanding of the tools they are going to use in that job, namely programming languages, and uh, in particular these uh, so-called, uh, what you could call modern mainstream uh, languages. <coughs> so they should be, good, uh, should be able to get, uh, make more effective use of their, their primary tools. Also, uh, they're going to work for 40 years or something like that and they'll be inundated with new technologies and new uh, tools and stuff over those 40 years, and they should be able to recognize some continuity in, in uh, those tools, so they don't believe that everything that's new is good, or that uh, it's actually new because many things are based on old uh, things. So in the course, there's more, more less focus on the classical compiler topics like uh, different grammar classes and decision problems for gram grammars and so on, and reg register allocation in uh, code generation, and more focus on uh, sort of high-level concepts uh, like uh, using bytecode, virtual machines, stack machines, types, continuations, and so on. Um, and also uh, some focus on history. Uh, actually, that much new technology they are seeing is quite old. Um, so um, I start with a sort of uh, genealogy of programming languages, and there may be 2,000 languages missing here, but, uh, but you know, it starts with Fortran back in the uh, way I go, and uh, then you can put it into various classes, uh, sort of what you call, call the old mainstream here, uh, the C and C++ and Fortran and so on. They are, of course, still being used. There's some uh, huge uh, class of mostly academic languages with many, many good ideas in them. And then there's what you could call the new mainstream. And some of the point is that the new mainstream, especially the new versions of Java and C Sharp, contain a lot of ideas from the academic languages, notably garbage collection and uh, parametric polymorphism. And you see F Sharp and Scala are sort of outside these. I can't really decide whether these are part of the modern mainstream or whether they are still academic. But maybe the point is that both of them actually belong to the modern mainstream because they are so closely related to this class as well. <coughs> right, and so the course, uh, conte course contents uh, is a brief uh, list of topics here, abstract syntax, stack machine, bytecode, lexing and parsing, interpretation and compilation, garbage collection, continuations, types, and program generation. And these can be detailed in various ways. Um, especially uh, by working on some homegrown stack machines and uh, also explaining how the JVM and .NET uh, machines, the explaining the design and the bytecode of these machines. Uh, talking uh, briefly about lexing and parsing and of course regular expressions and automata and grammars, but only as tools, uh, not in a theoretical way. Um, talk about uh, interpretation and difference to compilation, uh, various example languages, exp an expression language, a functional language, a subset of C, a subset of I icon, um, and the com compilation uh, from micro C to some uh, uh, stack machine. Garbage collection, 
various techniques and an extension of the micro C language that actually has uh, <coughs> con cells, a bit perverse, but that allows the students to implement a garbage collector in C for, for this, uh, again, abstract machine <coughs> and see how that works. Uh, continuations are important. We we'll talk about to ta tail recursion, how to implement exceptions, how to implement micro icon, and actually using compile time continuations in a sense you can do backwards code generation and that does do a backwards, a, a one pass compiler that does uh, um, optimizations on the fly. Type systems, of course, the distinction between dynamically and statically typed. Uh, where some statically typed languages like C Sharp have drifted a bit in a dynamic direction by the so-called the new dynamic type, um, and where dynamic language, dynamically typed languages like Clojure, uh, Python, Ruby, and so on have gained a lot of popularity uh, recently for some reason. But uh, there are some reasons for that, and we can dis discuss them on this, on this basis. Uh, <coughs> and also uh, concepts like co and contravariance uh, crept into mainstream uh, languages, not only in Eiffel and Simulan. Um, and finally, program generation, where I used to use scheme, two-level languages with backward and comma, but it might be possible to use F-sharp instead. So the whole point of this uh, talk is that this is taught with F-sharp as the meta-language. So F-sharp is used to explain this stuff to the students and present it. So um, I have developed uh, with my own lecture notes for this purpose giving the course for the second time this uh, semester. First time was last fall. So I use these lecture notes with exercises, F-sharp implementations of all the uh, constructions uh, shown in the course. I use uh, some lecture notes by Torben Mogensen from University of Copenhagen for lectures and parsers. There's no need to repeat that. I use uh, stretches, stretches uh, 42-year-old uh, uh, fundamental concepts lecture notes for L-value and R-value and a ton of other things that have turned into uh, C and standard ML. And then map reduce to explain or some motivate some uh, uh, higher-order functional programming and some papers about garbage collection. <coughs> Let's see the lecture notes. Uh, it's a there's a table of contents, if I can get this thing to react. Um, sort of standard stuff, interpreters, compilers, concrete syntax, blah, blah. Functional languages, polymorphic type, imperative languages. This micro C language, abstract machines in the real world, garbage collection techniques, continuations, uh, backwards compilation reflection, and runtime code generation. At the end, there's an appendix which contains an F-sharp crash course. Uh, so uh, I'll basically uh, explaining those parts of F# -sharp being used here, which is really only the core language, primarily the core language. <coughs> so why F#? -sharp? Uh, well, th many of these reasons uh, go for uh, other strongly ty statically typed uh, <coughs> functional languages as well. But the primary reasons are these two and these that in uh, F# -sharp and ML and so on. The abstract syntax can be uh, represented by algebraic data types, a very compact way. And then interpreters, compilers, uh, uh, optimizers, and so on can be written using pattern matching. So that's no surprise there at all. Um, but that's a reason for doing it. Uh, and also types on interpreters and compilers, especially those interpreters that use continuation style. The types uh, present a lot of information about what the evaluator does. F-sharp comes with uh, Lexa and parser generator tools, FSLex and FSYAC. Uh, so uh, you can do the lexing and parsing inside the same uh, thing. And then the uh, uh, primary reason for using F-sharp rather than something else is that it's good for real applications, especially in companies that use .NET uh, already, of course, uh, in some way. <coughs> so some students from previously working in a company are using F-sharp basically to to translate uh, queries to SQL queries and uh, run it on, on databases. A great uh, advantage, I believe, is that it interoperates well with uh, large existing libraries. So choosing F-sharp doesn't enclose the students in some academic uh, uh, um, um, special purpose language. 
and it works uh, reasonably well on all these uh, three platforms. The students have diff lots of different platforms running Linux on Macs and other bizarre things. So alternative choices, of course, Java, which the students know extremely well, so it would be maybe a better pedagogical tool, but it's uh, rather sad. To so far, no functions and certainly no pattern matching. C Sharp is another equally well uh, known language to the students. Uh, it does have uh, functions, uh, lambdas, so called uh, lambda abstractions, but still no pattern matching. Standard ML is an, uh, the language I used previously for this sort of thing uh, using Moscow ML, MosML Lex, and MosML Yak. It's a very neat, beautiful language, but it's for all intents and purposes a dead one and means that the students will have a hard time taking the constructions they learn using that language and just immediately use them in some other, other code. And uh, OCaml is a much more live language, but still has some pro problems integrating with other code and uh, are not many books and sources on uh, OCaml introductory programming. Scala is a language that gets a lot of attention in Europe uh, these days. I don't know about the US, uh, it does have functions and pattern matching um, and a very beautiful integration between the functional and object-oriented uh, world and it works on the Java platform so it integrates well with uh, other things. Uh, but it would be new to students. Uh, on the other hand, it's somewhat less winter-bound than F-sharp but since yesterday's announcement, announcement uh, F-sharp is even less winter-bound than it used to be. My um, a practical reason for choosing F sharp is that F sharps, FS Lex, and FS Yak are very close to those tools, and so it was quite easy to um, migrate all my examples to, to F sharp. So uh, you really know this already, but let's see, look at it anyway. Why pattern matching? It's uh, because it's so easy to implement, I express both the abstract syntax and the manipulations of the abstract syntax. So here's a functional. Representa uh, representation and interpretation of simple expressions with variables like these. If you do it the same in, uh, in uh, Java or C Sharp, it would look like this. The subclasses, an abstract superclass up there, and three subclasses, and, uh, and eval methods here, and virtual dispatch. It's only uh, three times as verbose, uh, but that, that's not really the problem. Uh, Worst thing is that it scatters the action of the interpreter over all these classes. So whereas uh, you could show this uh, thing on a slide in when explaining the interpretation of uh, expressions, constants, well, just evaluate to themselves, variables are evaluated by lookup and so on. Um, that sort of quickly gets pretty horrible if you have many different syntax classes here. <coughs> it's not like... Uh, I hate O abstract syntax. It's really quite useful. So here's from a completely different uh, project using uh, C sharp, ele roughly 11,000 lines of code. And here's the somewhat impressive uh, abstract syntax representation uh, used in that, uh, uh, that piece of software. And the good thing about uh, this, of course, is that you can have uh, small hierarchies and say here that an expression is an abstract concept here, but one of the Another abstract subconcept is uh, constant expressions, and then you have different kind of concrete constant expressions. So if you want to do partial evaluation on this sort of thing, it's very nice that you have a co common concept of being constant over here. And similarly for all the strict operations, those that evaluate all the arguments have a common superclass, whereas the non-strict ones are uh, siblings to that. So this is actually quite useful and uh, a very concise way of uh, presenting uh, the structure of a, a large and complicated piece of uh, software. But uh, for the purpose of teaching programming language concepts, I uh, think that the important thing is that the students can, um, can understand that this way of doing things using uh, algebraic data types recursive ones, and uh, this way of doing it uh, using abstract uh, superclasses, inheritance, and virtual dispatch, are exactly the same thing done in two different styles of language. And the good thing about using uh, 
uh, functional language in uh, this particular course is that um, you can treat a whole language like uh, a subset of C and one slide, basically. So well, the, the biggest language they see in the course that, that they treat using an interpreter and compiler is um, a language called micro C. <coughs> it has arrays that point arithmetics and so on, which is basically the core of, of C. Uh, so there's a compiler to a simple stack machine code and that's implemented in Java and in C. Um, and it does a, another version of the compiler that generates code backwards to, uh, to optimize it on the way. But there's no register allocation, instruction scheduling, and so on. And then, as I said, there's a version of micro C extended with uh, con cells so that the students can take this C abstract machine here and extend that with the uh, garbage collectors. And doing all the stuff you need to do when you have a garbage collector with garbage collection bits and colors and stuff and, and uh, mani uh, have bit bitwise manipulations. And that's something where C, of course, really shines to, to do this sort of runtime system. But the point of, uh, of, uh, of this was that the whole uh, micro C language uh, can be presented in, uh, in one slide, the whole abstract syntax here, that you have uh, types, expressions, those expressions with R value or those with L value, statements, uh, statements and declarations, top level declarations and whole programs. And uh, uh, you could do the class hierarchy, uh, the class diagram on a single slide as well, but it would give you much less information about what is actually in the uh, different uh, components of the abstract syntax. So I think this is uh, a, uh, a beautiful, concise presentation of a small and elegant language, namely the core of C. And that's possible because we're using uh, a, a functional language to present it. <coughs> right. Another thing that uh, where the functional language really shines is in presenting using functions as values. And uh, that's one of the other examples they see in the course is a subset of icon. Icon is a language with backtracking where an expression can produce zero or more uh, um, results. And the neat way to implement that is to use two continuations and have a continuation-based interpreter that takes an icon expression and a success continuation and a failure continuation uh, as um, as argument and produce a uh, value. And so here's a fragment of the uh, interpreter um, to interpret a uh, constant you call the success continuation with the um, result, the constant as argument and the failure continuation uh, to evaluate and conditional if E1, then E2, else E3. And there's a semantics in icon that if uh, this expression succeeds at all, which has more than zero of the results, it will evaluate that one, otherwise it will evaluate that one. And there's no backtracking back into E1. So the success continuation for E1 ignores the result of E1, it ignores the uh, failure continuation of E1 and simply evaluates E2, and similarly for E3. So that's fairly easy to explain here. Try to write that in Java using uh, uh, anonymous inner classes and so on, and the whole thing goes like this, and it's completely impossible to see what's going on. In C Sharp, of course, it would work because of the uh, modern uh, function syntax in C Sharp. But I think this uh, sort of, it would come, Java would completely obscure the point and the beauty of this. Uh, C Sharp, it would work, but still in the, uh, C Sharp would still miss the, um, um, Pattern matching features, right? Yep. So uh, to summarize a bit, uh, the, uh, the good thing about this is that there's support for that F# -sharp provides support for functional programming in the mainstream now, uh, with um, Visual Studio and the Mono developer uh, uh, maturity we have seen. Uh, that it has compact data types and pattern matching, so we can show concepts as code. You can make concepts extremely clear on slides without drowning them in uh, curly braces and so on. Uh, and the students can experiment with these concepts in exercises uh, simply by trying to modify these interpreters. 
they could do that as well in, in object-oriented languages, of course. But sometimes the changes would be somewhat non-local. And the tools uh, provided with uh, F-sharp, FSLEX, and fs are simple and but rather powerful that an LA, LR, uh, one uh, parser generator. And they're very similar to their Camel and MOSML uh, cousins. Uh, so uh, at least I'm used to them. And uh, a great thing about the FS YAC is that uh, it can export the parser automaton. So you can really explain to the students what happens in an LR parser by uh, investigating the states of the parser automaton that it uh, produces. It might not be as uh, optimized and so on as Python or something similar, but it doesn't matter. A couple of things are ungood and not so good with uh, using F sharp for this purpose. Uh, students find functional programming uh, hard because they, either because it is hard, which I don't think, or because they're brought up with these uh, object oriented uh, concepts. And it may in some way get in the uh, way of teaching the programming language concepts. Uh, these are not MIT, uh, CMU, Harvard uh, class students. They are more pedestrian, so to speak, but uh, pretty nice people, even so. But uh, still, you shouldn't put too many uh, things in their way. Um, f -sharp, uh, over the last uh, years, have been a uh, somewhat moving target. I guess that with the release of version 2 and integration into Visual Studio, it, this has uh, hopefully uh, will slow down a bit. There's been some syntax changes, some problems uh, here and there with mono compatibility, whether v uh, Visual Studio would actually support it as well, and so on. And F sharp uh, is uh, documentation is not quite at Java uh, C sharp level um, at this time. The error messages produced by the Lexan parser tools could be better. And uh, since it's open source, I could try to make them better. But it's not the kind of thing I have too much time for. And there's still uh, at least one bug in uh, FS YAC where it ignores some non-associativity uh, uh, declarations. The Visual Studio support uh, for FS Lex and FS YAC is somewhat hard to configure to get it work to work uh, reliably. It has become much better, and it's hopefully going to be really. Um, really nice. Um, the students are used to environments like um, Eclipse and Visual Studio that give them syntax highlighting, uh, um, type checking on the fly, and all those uh, this uh, s stuff. And so they are uh, <coughs> somewhat allergic to using com uh, command lines and uh, notepad style editors, Emacs, and similar uh, things. Uh, of course, uh, we force them to do that, uh, but it might uh, actually reflect negatively on the on the technology, which is a, a bad thing. Um, also, some students uh, have uh, some reservations are more of a political nature that's considered as some one company language uh, would by some students who would much prefer uh, Java, Scala, or something else. Uh, again, I think that yesterday's announcement will uh, go a long way to addressing some of these concerns, but it's the kind of thing that you encounter out there. Right. So I think that's what I wanted to say about the uh, course itself. And then there's a wish. Um, I think that was mentioned earlier. We don't really have a good uh, introduction to functional programming with F-sharp, as near as I can tell. There are lots of F-sharp books that are really good, gives a lot of details about different aspects of the language. But something that starts with functional programming, more or less from scratch, maybe for people who all understand Java or something like that. But uh, really, uh, um, are new, completely new to functional programming, and they're uh, not interested in five million subtle uh, aspects of the language, but really the core functional programming. Um, so um, that's this old uh, textbook, uh, Introduction to Programming Using Standard ML, which is still in print after 11 years, although uh, ML is, uh, is not so live. And uh, I really like to see a, uh, an F sharp version of this one. I've tried to have contact with the authors of this one, and they seem to be uh, willing to consider this project. And I think that would be uh, make it much easier for our students to uh, learn it in the first place. And then we can build on the, their knowledge of F sharp in, uh, in further courses. So um, the course uh, 
I'm talking about has a home page, uh, the le uh, lecture notes and with exercises and so on are on the web. And here's Tom Monson's uh, um, uh, lecture notes where we are using chapters two and three. Uh, MSDN channel nine recorded a video where I talk about this course a couple of months back. This has this beautiful uh, URL, uh, but there's uh, a little more details. If uh, uh, personally, I'd much prefer uh, reading this stuff than looking at this video. But some people apparently like videos a lot. Um, actually, a couple of years back, uh, I presented this uh, design for this course in a uh, workshop, seek plan workshop. Um, and an interesting thing is that maybe at the time I suggested using C sharp as the major language, not F sharp, precisely for the reason that uh, choosing I think uh, F sharp wasn't perhaps uh, as mature at the time, but the mot motivation for choosing C sharp was that whatever tools I would teach the students in uh, the course, they should be able to go and use in a job. And that's now true of F sharp, so I think that that's great progress. So I changed my mind there from C sharp as a meta language to F sharp. Okay, thank you. That's uh, what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Rounded things off beautifully. Um, questions? On, yes, at the back there. Right, so uh, so you say, I, as you noted, I, I'm an author of the C5 uh, collection library, and the question was, how much should the students uh, learn about the internals of these uh, things instead of just using them? I think they should definitely, uh, uh, like they should know the internals of uh, their programming languages, uh, programming languages, they should know the internals of the data structure libraries. Uh, uh, so we, are, we have a, a, an algorithms and data structure course where they uh, learn this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, still, the libraries, of course, are extremely valuable because they give a standardized uh, interface to things. And uh, yeah, uh, you don't have to reinvent the red-black tree for the 215th time. Um, and there are lots of things that are very, very easy to get wrong in, uh, in collection libraries, for instance. But I think it's, it's very important that the students, as like uh, engineers who build bridges, should uh, know about uh, structural engineering and the properties of their tools. Yes. Uh, our software engineers should know the properties of their tools and therefore they need to know algorithms and data structures and uh, programming language concepts and compiler concepts and so on. Although they're probably, many of them are not going to write a compiler, they may do something small domain specific language on, on the job or they might be tempted to do it uh, after having these tools. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Peter, and uh, we'll have more questions, of course, now. I'll just give Peter his chocolates, toffees. Thanks a <laughs> Thank lot, you. Judith. Thank you for coming all Thanks. this way. And so now the moment you've all been waiting for, which is your turn to talk. All right. So we're going to have four people up here. That's David Walker, Nigel Horspool, Susan Eisenbach, and myself. And... We're going to have a panel. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this with the cameras. We've only got two that look funny. <laughs> yeah, so let's just put these and see if the cameras will adjust. They might. Grab a chair. I think. I think they can do it. All right, so the situation is that what we're going to talk about here is some of the thoughts from you. You are allowed to state your viewpoints. And in order to get it all started, uh, Nigel's got a few slides that he's going to show, which will... Um, we got another chair? Right, thanks, David. 
Uh, before he does, I'll just tell you why we've got these uh, th three luminaries here. <laughs> luminaries. <laughs> oh, comfy chairs. Oh, but these are such, these are such heavy comfy chairs. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Camera's over here. We'll take these back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so somebody's going to be standing, which will probably be me. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, round about in July, my, my group decided it was a good thing to start supporting F Sharp in education, and one of the ways we were going to do this was to ask people who we knew if they would like to work with us in producing courseware for Microsoft. So we asked various people, uh, some of them are sitting on that side and weren't in a situation at the moment to do so, but David over here and Sue said that they could help us out and they've been uh, diligently doing some a courseware which they're going to tell you about, hopefully, and about their experiences in doing so. Nigel came on board as well because he'd been teaching F Sharp in his course, which is a little bit related to the one you've heard about from Peter. And he's been, um, he's got some experience in that, so he's been talking to all of us about it. So I'm going to hand over to Nigel now to show us his slides. Okay, great. Okay, so Judith didn't quite explain the course I was teaching. Actually, he was doing a comparative programming languages course, the kind where you have to introduce students to different programming languages and compare their features and so on and argue the pros and cons of the different ones. And so uh, um, I, I thought I could use that as a starting point for, uh, for uh, this little particular panel session um, and give you my experience of it. So my thought is that when you're teaching computer science for a degree, the student should come out of it knowing more than one programming language and being able to program in more than one programming paradigm. Um, you know, and I saw my comparative programming languages course as being one way of fulfilling that goal. Now, this, I can, if I can leave it to my colleagues, you know, the students will come out knowing just Java and C and nothing else. And they will never program recursively, you know, and they will miss a whole bunch of other good stuff in the computer science curriculum. So I took it upon myself to rectify a big hole, and uh, and um, I, I uh, sort of I think I did a pretty good stab at it. But anyway, let's try and sort of set the scene. So I, I just uh, the other day looked and searched around to see you know what would the programming language actually in demand for computer science graduates these days. And this is the top 10 list. And actually, it's a, it's a little bit depressing in that it doesn't cover all the paradigms I wanted to teach. You know, and I, we really don't want to teach Visual Basic and JavaScript and you know, these other things at university level. No, this is you know, too much nonsense there and uh, don't, don't cover the concepts too well. Um, Know, and if I'm trying to cover all the paradigms, you know, this, those 10 languages are missing some. You know, like they don't cover functional at all, you know, unless I really pervert the languages that I'm trying to use. And concurrency isn't really covered there either. You know, again, you could do some libraries to get some concurrency, but the languages themselves do not directly support it. Okay, um, and if I'm trying to pick languages to teach my students in my comparative programming languages course, and you know, I sort of hunted around a little bit for, for what might work, and so some of the key factors involved in a good programming language, uh, it should be easier to write than the competition, and uh, Don, uh, actually Don Symes' talk this morning was actually perfect for, for supporting all of these points. Um, the, the language should be easier to write, <laughs> 
Uh, and examples of that would be that you make fewer declarations while you're writing the code, and you don't have to fill your program with lots of extra logic to uh, handle um, garbage collection, you know, freeing up the storage you're using. Um, and of course, F-sharp is winning wonderfully on those so far. Um, the language should be reasonably efficient, you know, more efficient than much of the competition and not as bad compared to uh, the ones we use. Um, and so, again, f -sharp is still not doing too badly. It's, you know, it, it, shouldn't, it doesn't produce CPU-intensive software, unless, of course, it really is doing a CPU-intensive problem. So on. <laughs> Higher quality for the programs, you know, and um, that sort of essentially means that when you're writing the code, you, you don't make all those silly mistakes and then waste your time afterwards hunting the bugs. And again, Don made the point that if you're writing in a functional paradigm, the programs just seem to work first time, or at least close to work first time. If they pass the type save check and you've written recursively, they're, they're, they're pretty reliable. Um, and you should be more productive when you're using the programming language. Uh, so if you've got access to a lot of libraries at the right levels of abstraction, uh, again, you're doing really well. And I would argue that the .NET libraries are pretty good at this. So I, I'm seeing this as sort of an argument that F-sharp is pretty good uh, on all the points that I've raised on that previous slide. You know, it's uh, concise, it's got this garbage collection. It's JIT compiled to give you efficiency at runtime, so you can rely on all the work that goes into building the .NET framework and, uh, and the, the common language runtime. That'd be fantastic. OK. Um, now, which paradigms does F-sharp cover? Um, so uh, it's a little bit of debate about what's a programming language paradigm. So I just opened up a textbook on my shelf, and I took one off. It happened to list these six paradigms. I rather liked it. Uh, and so F-sharp, I, th I would argue, again, compare it against the competition here. Um, yeah, now we come to F-sharp here. Uh, F-sharp is strongly functional. So that's what, So I was using my F-sharp in my course to, uh, to introduce the students to functional programming. To, uh, it's the very first thing. So let's uh, so set the scene a little bit. I, I taught three courses, uh, three languages during that course, but I used F-sharp for more than 50% of the time. And the first thing I did was cover the functional paradigm, and I told the students no mutable variables. I, ex I, I explicitly disallowed all the things that would let them get escape from the functional programming paradigm. And that worked wonderfully. I gave them lots of exercise, and they really got into the right frame of thinking. Um, then I introduced them to a bit of the object-oriented paradigm in the F-sharp uh, context, just so they could compare it against other languages they knew, like Java and C-sharp. And, uh, and that's worked out really well. And then for the last part of the course, we moved on to the concurrent paradigm. And we had great fun running uh, little parallel programs, doing all the computations that Don was uh, demonstrating this morning. They were doing very similar things in my class. And the students absolutely loved doing this. They finally could see the point of learning this new language. Um, and just to complete the story, uh, there is an imperative paradigm thought in F sharp, but it's not the reason why I wanted to teach it. You know, and it's probably not the right language for doing imperative style programming anyway. And all we're missing from this list is the logic paradigm, for which you probably the only one language out there that you know, is good is Prolog, maybe, and scripting, uh, which I will have to leave to another language like Python or Perl. So I. I I want to argue that you know, because of that great coverage of paradigms, you know, that F-sharp actually fits in the computer science curriculum practically all the way through. Now, it could be used as a first programming language if you've got a university that believes in teaching students functional paradigm first. Um, if, but if it's not, then it can certainly be used in the second year courses. Uh, it can be used in the third year courses and all the way through to, for example, as Peter was just showing, to a compiler course in the fourth year. It's got places everywhere in your curriculum. Um, so, covers three of the six paradigms really well. Um, I'd say that it meets all our requirements for a teaching language, and the students can see that it's giving them skills to go on to a great career as a software developer. They're, just, you know, they're, they're getting exposure to the .NET libraries, and even if they're forced to use C-sharp in their industrial job, they still know how to do things. Um, 
And I'd say at the moment, the only big deficiency for this being a, a <coughs> hardcore teaching language is sort of a lack of materials. So if we had an introductory textbook, we could use it in first year. If we had um, the book that actually we've just been demonstrated to you as being able to transition from object-oriented to, uh, to functional, then maybe that would fill in for a, a later, later book in the series. And there were my references, so that's the whole thing. So. I'll let someone else carry on now. Well, maybe you want to ask me Thanks. questions. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well done, Nigel. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so because actually yeah. uh, Nigel didn't put a yellow box around first year, and we do have our two panelists yeah. here, I'm going to let ladies go first, David, and ask Sue to speak, and then David, yeah. about what they've been doing in their courses, which is actually very different. So, Sue. Yeah. I'm at Imperial College, and someone described our education as being fascist, um, <laughs> in that that uh, for that first of all, our students don't major; they only study computer science. And secondly, we've been running as our first programming language since I think in 1988, a functional language, and we have. We put our absolute best lecture on the first language. And um, we've changed the syntax of the language from time to time as that was appropriate. But the actual course is remarkably similar to what it was before. And we believe we produce the best programmers in the world, and we, which of course, America doesn't acknowledge at all. But what can I say? Um, and I, we think that one of the major reasons is because we start with a functional programming language. When I first went to Imperial in 83, about 90% of the students who came in knew how to program. And we're now running at 50 to 60%. So times have changed. It was an unpopular subject in 83. It's a very popular subject um, now. But one of the main things that a functional programming language does is it levels the playing field. It levels the playing field completely, and it teaches that writing clear programs is both hard and undoubtedly worth doing. And I don't know how, if you start with Java, you can teach people that sort of elegance is something that's desirable. It, you just can't do it. Um, so I think that, and we're looking now, I mean, we, te we teach Haskell. I don't know how long that will continue or not, but what we're doing is we're converting our material to F sharp, removing the bits that go ugly when you go from Haskell to F sharp, and adding the bits that are lovely in F sharp for introductory programming that don't exist in Haskell. We're doing the trade off now, and I assume they'll be live from Microsoft in a few months' time. I think so. All right, so uh, I'm a professor at Princeton, and um, uh, what I'm doing is actually something quite different. Uh, uh, I am teaching a, a graduate course. I'm actually co-teaching it with uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, David August. Um, so um, I had a couple of goals with this course. Um, one of them was to um, convince my colleague and uh, some of his students that uh, functional programming um, was a, a reasonable um, programming paradigm and that one could uh, do some interesting things uh, with functional programs that one uh, couldn't necessarily do uh, very easily with um, C, uh, which is uh, his language um, of choice. So it, it's a bit of a, a, a tough battle uh, against him, um, but um, I think we've at least managed to introduce uh, some of his students who are perhaps uh, less um, entrenched in their ways uh, to some uh, interesting uh, different kinds of um, programming paradigms. So the, the course, um, as it's taught with two people, has a, a quite a diversity of um, topics in it. It's a graduate course, and it's a seminar course. So um, the way we've uh, arranged it, actually, is we have um, groups of students who are in charge of developing different modules. Uh, and so uh, you know, there is um, a module that uh, one group of students has that have de has developed on um, uh, imperative um, shared memory programming. There's another uh, module that has been developed using um, F-sharp uh, that uses the uh, asynchronous uh, reactive uh, 
functional program that you've seen. There's another module um, that um, deals with Erlang style message passing systems with complete um, uh, isolation. Uh, there's going to be another um, module that's going to be on um, using um, um, high level languages um, like uh, Dryad and how do those get um, parallelized on um, you know, m massive uh, sets of machines. So it's um, a series of, of different topics where we look at different um, uh, parallel programming uh, paradigms uh, and, and try and look at the pros and cons of those different things. And uh, each of the students gets sort of an educational experience because uh, they get to um, you know, develop some, some courseware and um, develop some of the teaching uh, materials that go along with it. Um, so certainly, uh, you know, F Sharp has uh, played a very nice uh, role in that mix. Um, because you can actually um, use it to uh, model a number of, of these different um, elements. So, for instance, we uh, uh, you know showed the message passing in um, Erlang, and and then actually we developed a little assignment where they use the F# -sharp message passing system um, to do some some similar uh, kinds of programs, although in a, a little bit of a different style. Uh, anyway, that's 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 what we've been doing. <laughs> Now over to you. Dean's got the other microphone, I think. So make your comments, and we'll answer them if and as required. So Dean's going to use that that one. You can say who you are and where you come from at this stage. Michael Levin of uh, Smart Cloud in Massachusetts. Uh, just want to state my wish that there would be a specification of the F-sharp language on the order of Guy Steele. Any chance that that's going to happen anywhere? Inadequacies in that spec. Well, uh, the only on spec I found is a grammatical spec. Uh, no, there's a specification on the search of Google for or what it Google for F sharp language specification, it'll come up with a 200 page PDF. Or so. Okay, I will look uh, for it. it. Now, there are some inadequacies in that document. Are we, are we not, it's not hard to get a specification of any language you know, up to the level. There's many people in the audience who worked on that. No, we love your feedback on that. And uh, we actually have Penny here who's, w has, uh, where's Penny? Yeah who is, uh, has been helping to copy edit the spec, give it a good glossary, give it a good index, and is now you know, diving right into this really doesn't make sense, this bit of the technical de sort of detail, and you know, she can help, to f to help fold in feedback, and I can help with that as well. So. That was a great question, and uh, I'm glad we filled that hole, yeah. Okay, over here, Dean. <laughs> Yeah, I think someone mentioned that what drives the curriculum is, or, or you mentioned the top 10 um, programming uh, languages used now, which of course will change over time. But where I teach, I teach at Rhode Island College, one of the things that drives our first course in computer programming is what the AP programmer programming language is in. We teach a lot of perspective teachers. They want to know the language that the AP is in. So my question is, have any of you guys um, thought about trying to influence the AP um, Educational Testing Service um, to try to implement a functional programming language as opposed to Java for their AP? Um, as of this year, the AP is changing their their requirements away, f hopefully away from Java to language agnostic. This hasn't been decided, but they've got at the moment five pilot projects going with five different languages, one of which is C Sharp, and the others are Python, etc., etc., but then doesn't include F Sharp. Vera can perhaps give us even... Ah. 
Well, they didn't choose them specifically. These were volunteers who volunteered to do it. The, the, I think it's almost an impossible task. They, they're going to set up an exam which is language agnostic. Ow. Um, Right. So probably probably the answer is at the moment not uh it might be a bridge too far. No well, do you work with the AP people? I want to poll the room. Um, for those of you at universities, um, does your university actually accept AP computer science scores to test out of one or more courses? Yes? CS elective. CS elective. Yes, but soon, uh, soon no. Yes. OK, uh, hands up. <laughs> uh, Yes, it's possible to place out of CS1 with an AP with an AP CS test. One, two, three, four, f five. About to be four. <laughs> um, and how about no answers? How many? Yeah, colleges that do not currently allow you to test out of CS1 with an AP score. One, two, three, four, five. And a bunch of and a bunch who did not answer the question. But in this room anyway, and I don't think this is necessarily a selective set of colleges. Selective selective set of subs in this room that do not accept APCS scores at all than that do. Why are we worried about AP? Why are we driving our curricula based on AP if we're not going to accept it anyway? I will tell you why. It has nothing to do with the colleges. It has to do with the high schools. And even though my um, son did not get any credit for the AP, he wanted to get them for the prestige and also uh, so that select colleges would look in favor of it. So it isn't to get the college credit, it's get to get a course that is prestigious. You don't want to keep high school kids from learning computer science. You want them to learn something about computing which is valuable. And something like what Susan said, you start with functional programming and you're going to be really understanding what's going on and you can have lots of fun. You know, we do it too. Question over there. I'm the lone high school teacher in this group, okay? I, I saw the list, I'm, I'm it. And we need to teach computer science in high schools. We need to prep our kids ready for college, no matter AP or not, doesn't matter. We need to prep them for, for college. And that's, that's the whole idea of high school. And uh, the reason why I'm here is I have a, a principal that's very fantastic. He, he believes in prepping these kids. And when I talked to him, about, I, have a, I resurrected a program in our school. It was dead. I resurrected the program. It's now I have kids joining it. it. I used Java because Java was easy to start with. And now I have a, the ability to start a second level course. And that second level course, I want to introduce these other paradigms to show the kids that this is now one language, there's so many of them out there, and show them some comparisons. And I was going to use a nine weeks block to maybe show F sharp, and another nine weeks block to show another language, so I can show some comparisons to these kids so that when they come out of high school, go to college, they can make an informed decision of how they're going to approach computer science. If that's the, that's the uh, 
career of their choice. I'm dead serious. I, I, uh, I mean, we could bypass this whole AP crap and um, uh, instead focus on that level. And actually, it's a simple, elegant thing to teach fifth graders, sixth graders. Um, yeah, and I, so I did this the other day. I fired up OCaml the other day with my son, my 10-year-old son. He has no trouble picking it up. So uh, I, I actually think we're aiming low if we're thinking high school. Uh. Well, I'm trying not to be too pushy for teach scheme, but we have a program called Bootstrap, which is teaching functional programming, introducing interactive games to kids in Boston ghetto after school programs for sixth to eighth grade. And in 10 weeks, they make interactive game. But all, they learn about function evaluation, they learn about variables, they learn about booleans, and they are having fun. And these are kids who have no math background to start with, co called bootstrapworld.org. That one, Don. So, I mean, you made a valid point about the middle school, because uh, Logo is a language that was created very early on. As a matter of fact, that's the language I first taught uh, my computer science kids with. I, I taught a semester of Logo, then I went into Pascal, it's not now a dead language. but. Uh, that language is awesome, and you can teach that in elementary level, not just middle school. You even go down to the elementary level with that. Uh, hi, my name is Tatiana. I'm not a teacher or educator, and you, I'm a programmer. So you know programming is a huge job market. So the question teach or not to teach should not arise. You have to teach as early as you can. And it would be great to include this in AP. People should get credit for their job, for their abilities. So it should be. <laughs> it should be. I think I will ask a question of you. But first, I have to make one comment. I think it was uh, Nigel who listed the top 10 languages, and there was no functional language in there. I would disagree with you. I think JavaScript is quite functional if you use it that way, not the way it's usually used. Right. OK. Anyway, normally, nor yes, yes. normally, a panel consists of people who disagree with each other, I think. And I don't see that here. <laughs> and it makes me think about, you know, why isn't Microsoft pushing, you know, the, was it ETS, isn't it, that does the AP exam? Or is it, uh, have I got the wrong organization? Yes, the Educational Testing Service. But I don't know if Microsoft could push this because they'd be pushing F Sharp and they'd be, seeing that as, uh, they'd be seen as doing something to their own corporate advantage unless they teamed up with people supporting other functional languages you know, and, and said, we don't care which one, but we think this is good, you should use it. Any comments on that? I, I can give you what's happening in uh, all the corporations at the moment, and, and Microsoft is happy to be just one of those. Uh, the ACM started about 18 months ago with a big uh, push uh, to get um, computing in the core, it's called. Some of you might have heard of computing in the core, C in C. If you Google or Bing for computing in the core, it'll come up. And this was because two senators uh, rose, uh, had a bill. And the bill came up, and it was passed because I think very probably people weren't looking. And um, <laughs> the, this bill has now been passed that we're going to look at having computing at the, in the core of the curriculum. Because at the moment, even if you do take the AP exam, it counts the same as woodwork or art for your final credits in uh, your, your final exam in K-12. So they're going to change that now. And they've produced this fantastic booklet, which is uh, came out on the 6th of November. And you can get it online. It's called Running on Empty. Okay, You look up Running on Empty, you'll find it. And it's all about, uh, there's for every state in this country, there's a table which lists how badly every state is doing on how they are teaching computer science in schools and how far 
we have to go. And now Intel, Google, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft are all supporting this effort to change things because we need to feed the pipeline of people who are going to be our future employees and the employees of people like your company and Smart Cloud and all the rest of them. So there is a groundswell and, and these, these places like the ACM are also behind it. And there are people in the policy making world as well. That doesn't really affect F sharp, so maybe we should change the conversation a little bit. It's just a, a, good, a feel good piece of news. All right, so now you want some controversy among you three. We'll have to introduce some. Go for it, Sue. <laughs> so in Britain, we have two exams. We have an IT exam and a computer science exam at school. And the computer science is probably like your AP. It's sort of old-fashioned, reasonably standard material that uh, I taught in the 70s. And I, computer science is being pushed out by IT which is junk. I mean, it, it's how to use PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> you think I'm kidding you. And, and no. so most, <laughs> what? So, some, some of the boards who do these exams have dropped their computer science exam, whereas every child in Britain has to do IT. Okay. So I don't know what, whether in America they're going to go towards an IT model or a computer science No, model. they're not. <laughs> 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 okay, can, can I, yeah, well, before you start, can I ask a, a question that uh, I want to get some answers from, and, and Rich can speak as well, and that is, we'd like to cast your minds back to the morning's talks a bit, and also to the implementation things. One of the reasons why uh, Microsoft in particular dived into some of the work they've been doing recently is that they felt that the barriers to adoption of a language like F Sharp were the fact that it could only be used on Windows. And so much of that has changed. And so we'd like s some impressions as to whether you've appreciated that change and to, and to whether it'll actually make a difference. I mean, does that matter to people in this room or um, so on? Okay. Um, when you were talking earlier about um, encouraging students to pursue computer science, I'm very heavily involved in uh, STEM education support in the area, and Microsoft has, uh, the Educational Evangelist has invited me to come. They have programs like DigiGirls, trying to get girls interested in computer science. I've been involved with .diva. Um, there are a lot of concerted efforts to support you know, well, just students. I was just recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was at Google. They had a tech, um, a youth uh, um, education summit. Again, what's it like to work at Google? The kids ask questions. Even I ask the questions like, can you get a summer job, an after school job here? Can you know, sort of like shadow a, a programmer so they can get an idea of what it's like to really consider it as a profession. So there are concerted efforts. I happen to be an MIT alum. I did my degree in computer science and business. I know what I'm, I'm what 20, 30 years ago, it was wretched. Now it's fantastic. And I talk to the kids and I say, there's just no excuse. There are so many opportunities now and support, like the, some of the things you mentioned, to support the kids to pursue it as an, um, a viable option. I mean, the number one reason I haven't used F Sharp, I teach, I'm Greg Morissette, I'm in Harvard. The only reason I've used OCaml instead of F Sharp is uh, I did a poll of my class last year, 65% of the students had Macs. And um, so uh, I, you know, the, the two years ago when I looked at F Sharp, uh, the mono environment on, on the Mac just wasn't stable enough for me to, to commit it. And, and there's an, an install and configuration issue by the way, those things were just as bad for Java as far as I was concerned. Um, uh, so the flip side is for OCaml, I don't have the libraries, so it's sort of rich things, but I don't necessarily get them under mono yet either. 
I mean, uh, what I'd really like to have from Microsoft is, uh, is a, a, a virtual machine with Visual Studio and, and, uh, and a cut down Windows environment that is a zero config issue for the students. They could just download an image, run it, and, and, and be off and going, but have the full environment of F Sharp as opposed to uh, the, the sort of cut down mono version. problems whatsoever. You know, they say just installed the latest version of Mono and it was good enough. You know, it's, it didn't have quite all the libraries working exactly the same, but it was went up to the level of my course with no trouble at all. Yeah. You know, so you had the same experience. Well, well, similar. Yeah. Well, I, I actually I have two experiences. One, um, my uh, graduate students have um, Linux boxes and and you know they figured out how to you know download Mono. They had to install a little patch or something. They got it to run. The tech staff at Princeton trying to install um, F Sharp on a cluster of, you know, maybe non-standard, I don't know, some version of Linux I'd never heard of. They had, they basically have had trouble uh, doing that and haven't been able to get it uh, done. So I, for a grad class, um, you know, it, this worked fine. For a large undergrad, like first year class or second year class, I think. Uh, it, uh, well, uh, for Princeton's environment, it's not quite there yet, but it sounds to me like there's been some improvements, and um, potentially, you know, in January, we'll see uh, we'll see what's what it's like. So. Just to say a few things about the improvements that you mentioned. Uh, there's a project called fsxplat.codeplex.com. Uh, there's a link on the functional dash variations variations website. And the project attempts to provide um, packages for Linux and installer for Mac. Uh, I didn't show it in my talk because it needs to be updated to the yet to be released version of F Sharp. But that should be done by tomorrow or something like that. And the, the install that makes the installation procedure really smooth. Um, for Mac, it's just like clicking next, next, next in the installer. Um, on Linux, it's doing the Linux equivalent of clicking next, next, next. Um, so that's making it really easy to install F Sharp on, on uh, Mac or Linux uh, running on, on Mono. Um, and uh, hopefully the installation procedure for Mono develop plugin, it's going to be exactly this, well, as simple as, as possible. And that's quite recent thing that hasn't been too much advertised before. Uh, so I think that's that's partially the the answer to the setting up process. Uh, well, I'm from Northeastern with Vera, and my name is Richard Rosala. I teach web development. I've used ASP.NET for years, and one of the things that was a critical thing that made it work far better was when you could take your source code on your local machine and deploy it to the server without needing to deploy binaries. And once you did that, the server would take care of the recompilation by doing a just-in-time compile. And it reduced the number of bugs tremendously because students are always forgetting to deploy binaries. I've been asking around, and it's not clear that you can do the same with F Sharp, that you could have a C Sharp basic web project but have F Sharp code and get complete binary free movement of that code from your local uh, laptop to your server. And without that, it's going to impede the use of F Sharp tremendously. So I would argue that that has to happen, that Microsoft has to step up and allow multiple languages in the app code directories and compile them cleanly and have no need for any binaries on either the local machine. The binaries are hidden in faraway directories. and they get recompiled on the server. Then you could really see how much web code could be taken out of C sharp and compressed by the same factors of three or four we've seen in the slides, and people would stop doing most of their code in C sharp. C sharp would be wrapper code, and all of the algorithmic code would be F sharp. 
but Microsoft has to step up and support it. And I would further argue that once that happens, the freshman course could be web development, not standalone desktop development. So I think, so on the whole, we don't uh, target F Sharp as a, um, as a presentational web development language. You can certainly use it for code behind binaries, uh, analytical components behind the web development. But uh, I think Microsoft's recommendation today would be for web development courses to be in C Sharp as, as, you're, as you're doing it. So uh, I think it, 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 if you're going to land in the sweet spot for F Sharp in education, you, you, you have, there will be some limitations like that. If you, uh, similarly, um, if you are focused, say, only on Xbox game development or something in a course, then it, uh, you can do that with F Sharp, but you might find the material is more naturally set up to do that in, in C Sharp, right? I, I, there, uh, we, we accept that with F Sharp. You don't necessarily do everything. We don't, yeah. So there's some things we explicitly say, yeah, C Sharp would be the main game for that. But I've heard your feedback about making sure that there's a compilation free cycle for web development and understand that, that what a difference that makes. I think technically you could make that work but with if, if in the F sharp power pack um, code DOM implementation. But uh, we can talk about that offline. But just say I yeah and I the, the point about a web development course being a, a first course I think is an interesting one that people should seriously look at. I yeah I think not enough people are being taught web development in a uh, I know there's somehow there's something like F Sharp opens up a possibility in the longer term to teach uh, web development from with a cl slightly cleaner, more principled kind of way. Web Sharper might be an interesting thing for people to look at in that context. Uh, it's uh, it's basically coding JavaScript, but you're coding it in F Sharp instead, right? So um, I think that could be a very teachable system uh, for teaching web, web programming. Uh, well, just the, this doesn't address the issue of uh, the 65% uh, max, but uh, of course, you know, if to, if, since you want the full Visual Studio, um, that's available through the uh, DreamSpark uh, program. I guess the uh, professional edition it's for for nothing, I guess, for even high school students. So, Does it work? I'm Bob Harper from Carnegie Mellon. I just wanted to mention a couple of uh, points about us at Carnegie Mellon. We've, uh, uh, my views, I think, are a bit of a dissident here for, with respect to a lot of people. Uh, I've been advocating functional programming for a long time, and we have been revamping our introductory curriculum in particular for using uh, functional programming as a central uh, concept of teaching computing. And we completely ruled out using F Sharp. It's not possible for us to do this. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One, the principal one is the lack of modules. The most important thing about functional programming, from my point of view, is to be able to write down a signature and using ML terminology, for example, for a data structure like Q or a dictionary or so on, and to talk about multiple implementations of the same signature and the same piece of code satisfying multiple signatures. This is completely absent, and it's a, a, it, for me, it's a complete showstopper. The second thing is that uh, someone mentioned earlier about the need for a semantics. I would add to that, because of our emphasis on parallelism, the need for a cost semantics. The, it need, you, you have to be able to write down a program and analyze its complexity, as you do in a data structures or algorithms course, for the code you actually wrote, not in terms of some fictional idea about how it's compiled. And for this, you need a semantics. There's no cost semantics. It could possibly be done for F Sharp, so that was a, a plausible a plausible pathway for us, but it, at the moment I think it's not there and it's something that is very important. Third thing I would say is a more advanced level, uh, we've been teaching for about a dozen years now, uh, our, we have a, like many places do, a programming languages course. I will just throw in my, my, my own view, which is I am dead against the idea of a programming languages course that consists of a tour of the zoo. I think you learn nothing useful there. There is a comprehensive theory of programming languages in which all of the concepts that are important and can be carried over to new languages and to other situations can be explained in a completely uh, independently of going through and saying, oh, there's this language, there's that language, oh, look at this weird guy, oh, let's do that strange thing. That, it's a, to me, is a bankrupt exercise. And so F-sharp has, has no role to play at that level either. 
So what we found is although we're very strongly advocating functional programming, in fact, we're pushing it all the way through our curriculum, it, uh, uh, there, at this moment anyway, there's no use for us for f -sharp. Okay, so I mean, I think those are all, all good points. The, the one that um, probably isn't in your shopping list there is the one that came up several times about the need for industrial uh, teaching and some exposure to some real life languages, I think. Yeah. Okay, Cobinson, additional over there. My name is Chris Sutton. Um, when you teach a, like F sharp as a first language or use a functional language, what are the like uh, specific ten good tendencies or behaviors that you see in in students that are learning that way, as opposed to students who would learn with an object oriented language or something like that? I don't know how in current object-oriented programming languages you can actually see the structure of the program. It's just too long. Right? And if you can't see it, then it's more likely to sort of meander. Right? Well, we saw it in all, all, all their slides, too. Just, well, there's only so many lines of code I can keep on in my head, if it's all on one page, I can understand it. If it goes across eight pages, I may have lost concentration. Um, and it's very hard in something like Java or C Sharp to say, I want to see the algorithm clearly. You just can't. It's, you know, even if it's as clear as you can in the languages, if it's not in a functional language, I think it's very hard to see it. There are lang other languages that you can. I mean, in Python, you can see the, the algorithms quite quite clearly, so it's not, I don't believe it's only functional languages, but to get students to value writing clear, concise code is hard, and that's one of the things you want, it's one of the main things you want in the first programming language. Um, you know, um, the goal of the first programming language is that sort of, for me, is any problem I can solve in a hundred lines of something all the students in the class can solve somehow. And I don't know how you get that in, in other languages. So I'm not looking at a web thing as the first language. I want my students to be able to, to choose the right data structure, choose the right algorithm for the problem they're solving. I think students should actually learn both OO and functional. That is, the OO paradigm has got its place. You know, the, the best example of this is user interface design, where all of the objects you can display on the screen have got a natural inheritance, and so OO is just perfect. You know. But on the other hand, you know, if you're trying to express an algorithm, and what is a three-line algorithm in, in a functional language becomes a whole page full of code in, in an OO language, then it's the wrong language. You know. There's a place for both. I'd have to look it up, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you. We'll send out a newsletter at the end of this uh at the end of this meeting with collecting all the the things that have been referred to. Sure. So one one thing that seems to be emerging as part of this discussion is sorry. My name's Ted Neward. And I don't I don't teach for anybody. Well, I used to do a lot of corporate training, so I guess that kind of counts. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I'm hearing is sort of a, a dichotomy, uh, two divergent goals from universities, and certainly from guys like me who go out and do corporate training, which is one goal, I want my students to understand the conceptual theory behind computer science versus the goal of I want them to be productive the day they hit whatever company they're going to work at. And I guess one of the questions I would ask is are these mutually exclusive goals? And if not, then for example, how is a student who has learned, you know, scheme going to find a job? Learn 
learn specific skills because the skill set changes in five years. And um, so the goal is for me to teach them enough that they can go to Barnes and Noble uh, and pick out the book and read it and understand it and, and, and gather the skill for themselves. So I'm less interested in teaching them specifics of a particular environment, a particular set. Of course, we do it along the way, and it's nice if they can also write on their resume, oh, I know this language and this environment and so forth. But that's it's just not a goal for me to teach them a particular set of uh, skills that will time out within a couple of years. We need to do both. We need to teach concepts and then the prevailing uh, languages at the time and expose to them as many as possible and show the interrelationship between all the languages. And that way they can go to Barnes and Noble and pick up the next language and the next language. Because I started out in basic, I mean, I'm that old, you know, and I, you know, but at least my, my background allowed me to go on to the next language and the next language. So that's what we need to teach our students, both things. Okay. Uh, when I started working on the project I'm working with uh, on Teach Scheme, I did it because 15 years before that, David Patterson and John Hennessy wrote a book, uh, Computer Design and Organi or Computer Organization and Design. And that was the year when people stopped teaching assembly language A and assembly language B, and they started teaching the principles of computer organization. And we are to this day still teaching language A and language B and language C instead of principles of how to design programs regardless of which language you use. And that's what got me working on this project because we didn't care about the language. We caught, caught, t uh, w worried about what, how do you design the program, how do you choose the right data structure, how do you design the algorithm, and how do you actually put the whole thing together. The language comes secondary, and once you understand that, you understand that different languages have better features, worse features. And, you know, I make my students cry because Java doesn't have functions as a first class object. But my students cry when they see that. That's what I want them to see. Tool chains and, um, and and specific languages. There's also the idea of practices, and I really wish that I had been taught unit testing and source control early in my career and as a student. Uh, you know, these kinds of things are very fundamental to not just software engineering, but they're things that everyone in a computer science curriculum should be familiar with because they're just they make you so much more productive. There are times when I rewrote the same assignment five or six times just because it gets on breaking, and then I would wreck it somehow and and editing it in my early computer science career, career right and and these are things that they really should be brought up immediately, I think at least. There's just, just um, first of all, it's 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 thrashing because I, it would mean that every year I would be updating the course to do the the latest hottest skill set. Um, as opposed to drilling down to the to the conceptual issues, so so I think we have to be very careful about that stuff. Well, one of the things I find very interesting about F Sharp is its support of multiple paradigms, so you don't have to go out of the language. So that if you want to do an object-oriented style, you can use it when it's appropriate in the language. One of the problems I've had with Java and which Vera's course has been resolving is the idea that Java has to be done in a very particular way and that the only important concept in an object-oriented language is inheritance. You almost have this idea that if it doesn't involve inheritance, it's not object-oriented. And frankly, I find that stupid. I mean, the one of the things that objects do is encapsulate state if you want to have mutable state. At, or you can encapsulate them in a hidden way so that they're immutable and then deal with functions based on that state. Another thing that object-oriented languages do is allow you to find purely functional functions. Static is forbidden in most courses, but static is essentially a function that has a functional language behavior. 
there is no extraneous state in the function, and you pass it parameters, and it does a computation and returns a value. And you can do an amazing amount of functional programming in object-oriented languages if you simply follow the paradigms of functional programming by passing parameters and computing results. So I think that there's a, not only is it bad that many schools are teaching Java, they're teaching it in a very narrow-minded way. And one of the things that would be good with F Sharp is that people would start to see things more flexibly. Guy, and then we're going to have something from our students over here. Hi, I'm Keith Patachi. I'm not in academia, but I think as a practitioner, I mean, something that occurs to me is that everyone's discussing this, or, or most people are, from the perspective of teachers. And I think in order to really teach people how to become great programmers, you do need to get down to the concepts and teach people those concepts. But I think in order to get people excited about the material, a lot of times you need a totally different approach, which is something that can be applied right away. And so I think there's sometimes maybe a delayed gratification if you're teaching people from the very basics of functional programming or, or other paradigms, and then only later do you give them, you know, it, you do you say, okay, now go to Barnes and Noble and buy a, a book on a language that you can actually use to write real software, you know, at a company or something like that. And so I, I would hope that potentially F Sharp could maybe bridge that gap where, you know, you have access to really nice libraries for .NET. Um, you know, there are a lot of tutorials out there that show you how to actually achieve reasonable applications in the language, but you can teach people that kind of functional core if you want. You can kind of start out from those basics. And so I think hopefully that's where languages like F Sharp could kind of come in. I'm Guy Blalock from uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, and one of our uh, original motivations for really emphasizing functional programming early in our curriculum was uh, to add parallelism. So our goal was to add parallelism right from the start, in parallel thinking. Um, and the reason to add uh, functional programming is that you can then get safe uh, 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 parallel programming. So the importance of safety and uh, avoiding race conditions and, and, and uh, avoiding mutable state, et cetera, uh, that really hasn't been discussed as really a, a big advantage of uh, today very much, of one of the big advantages of functional programming. And in particular, the examples I've often seen of F-sharp are not necessarily safe, uh, race-free programs. Uh, so I think if we want to, uh, you know, that is a, a, an opportunity for functional programming is to really push the safety aspects. Because safety is huge, I imagine, in, in Microsoft. The fact that you want safe programs that don't give you different answers on different days and crash on Mondays and not on Tuesdays. Uh, and, and that's really a big advantage of uh, functional programming in general. Uh, and so it, should, it seems like the, there should be some emphasis on that safe uh, parallel programming inside of a functional framework such as F-sharp. to that um, we'll put it on on the newsletter but you probably know uh, Tom Ball has spent the whole summer on this course that he's been doing on practical parallel programming um, concurrent programming using all the tools from Microsoft research which go into safe programming so that's the chess suite and so forth which you can then hook in side to um, check whether your programs are going to perform in the right way and also perform correctly and he's got a whole suite of courseware with that but um, it has to be taught people have to learn how to do it properly you don't just it, the language doesn't do it for you i don't think any language does but the, the courseware is available for f sharp and c sharp so we'll put the link on for that as well so over to you from Bryn Mawr. hi i'm christina i'm a sophomore at Bryn Mawr and I'm a computer science major and I took AP computer science in high school and I don't think it helped me at all um, as far only like loops that's pretty much it I remember <laughs> that's pretty much what I remembered but um, for the most part most of my classes that I've taken so far have been taught using Python and I was just wondering like how do I transition from like just learn how knowing Java and like Python into like because I wasn't taught in a functional language to begin with. So how do I move forward from that and like, improve my programming skills? So the, the question really was, if, you, if you're one of the people who is now 
non-functional and is going to move into the world. <laughs> what, 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 is, what is the lifeboat? <laughs> okay. Hi, I believe you use the uh, the scribbler robots there, right? And um, I will say, maybe it's not ideal, but a lot of the algorithms you probably learned to control the robot could be written in a more functional way. Uh, we've had a lot of talks recently about the fact that there's structural recursion versus other kinds of recursion. And this isn't structural, this is commanding a robot, which is basically a, a stateful thing. But we do, a, we do Python in our first two courses. And we, we don't have robots, but we, we have, you know, a drawing program, a turtle. And I, you know, I don't know what to tell you to do, except I guess I could send you to our websites and you could do our labs. But it, it, is, it is possible to do a lot of the same things, especially in Python, which supports functional programming in a different way. And to be honest, if you'd like me to get back to you with more on that, I could. It is very traditional that, that all the uh, panelists uh, get to say something, um, but uh, shall, shall we forego that and go and have coffee? Yes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>